Uh, my name is Abdul Wahab Al Kipsi. I am regional director for the Africa and Middle East programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise. Hi, Abdul. Thank you for doing this interview with us. Um, as head of the Middle East and North Africa um, group at SIPE, can you give us a basic overview of SIPE and its relationship with the Syrian Economic Forum? Yes, um, SIPE is an organization uh, that strengthens democracy around the world through private enterprise and market-oriented reforms. And uh, we've been working uh, with Syrian partners for, for a few years. Uh, we started working with uh, Syrian partners, Syrian uh, reformers, uh, Syrian uh, private sector leaders to improve the environment in Syria, uh, the economic environment, the political environment, to help them uh, uh, develop the uh, legal and regulatory uh, environment inside the country so entrepreneurs uh, are able to register their business, to get licenses, to improve um, their, their uh, economic situation, to be able to provide better for their families. And uh, so we've been working with Syrian partners, one, on developing an entrepreneurship program, and two, to work on uh, uh, corporate governance. But of course, uh, Syria, like the rest of the Arab world, unfortunately for Syria, it's taking longer than the others. The Arab uprisings, the Arab revolution, what people are referring to as the Arab Spring occurred. So everything had to be put to a stop initially. But then uh, meeting with our partners and our friends in Syria, we decided we can't not try to help uh, the Syrian private sector leaders get a voice so that they are included in uh, policy reform ideas for the future of Syria. Uh, so uh, we initially met with a, these, a group of these business leaders and they decided they wanted to establish a think tank. Uh, they decided to call it the Syria Economic For Syrian Economic Forum. They uh, established a board uh, and we helped them every process of the way uh, to do it. Uh, it's, uh, they're, they're innovative, they have a fantastic approach to do this, they build relationships with a lot of the think tanks in the Middle East region and abroad and we're absolutely proud and honored to be able to work with them as they move forward doing that. What changes have you seen in the private sector and civil society in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya, and Yemen? Can you give us a success story of business in those countries? Uh, yes, it's uh, still too early. If you're talking about success stories post-Arab Spring, in my opinion, it's still early to uh, gauge impact and success uh, in these countries, uh, but I, we've been working with business leaders and uh, political leaders in these countries for many, many years. Uh, and like w what we did in Syria, um, in these four countries, just as soon as the Arab Spring uh, started, uh, we felt it was absolutely necessary for us to work with our partners that we've built trust and uh, working relationships for many, many years before this. So I'll give you an example. I mean, like I said, we're working with business leaders in Libya, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and in Yemen, in addition to many other countries, from Morocco to uh, Bahrain to Lebanon, almost every country in the Arab world. But in these four countries specifically, we were able to uh, get together, sometimes in country, sometimes because of the security situation, we had to leave uh, the country and uh, work outside for, for initially and to help them develop visions, economic visions for the country moving forward. Now, as we know, all these four countries are going through a process, a political process, to elect uh, parliaments or constituent assemblies to develop the constitutions, then develop the constitutions, then have uh, elections based in these constitutions, etc. Then, de then develop the laws, the legislation that is necessary. But what we noticed is that there was a, 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 an absence of the voice of the private sector in these reforms. Uh, and we also noticed, unfortunately, that most of these solutions are pushing towards more and more of the same policies that were happening before that were one of the reasons that led to the revolution. So they're hiring more people in the public sector. Well, we have bloated public sectors in all these four countries that cannot sustain uh, the, 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 this, this employment. So we can't have even more. We have to have less public sector employment and more private sector employment. Unfortunately, that's where we're headed. We're headed to uh, uh, indiscriminate subsidies of goods, whether it's, whether it's oil products, whether it's bread, whether it's uh, uh, wheat. 
And again, these policies are non-sustainable and they will cause more hardship and more problems and it will not create the dignity, I underline the word dignity, for these young men and women who are seeking these jobs. So to give them a government job and then for them not to produce anything, to be completely dependent on the government, we feel is not good for the, for the, the Arab world and especially for these uh, four countries. So uh, we were able to work with leaders from these countries and I'll give you the example of Yemen where a group of some of the major business leaders who are reformers, not part of former regimes, not part of the, the uh, uh, clique that was around, that was benefiting from the former regimes, these are reformers who have known to be reformers. We, got, we were able to work with them to get them together into one room, and then we helped them with uh, experiences from other countries. So we, we brought somebody from the Philippines, an expert who's gone through the change and the reform in the Philippines, uh, from Bulgaria, from uh, Serbia, not for the Yemenis to copy these examples, but for them to study them, to see what worked, what didn't work, and what, uh, and then for them to develop their own vision, because every country has its own um, uh, needs, its own uh, potential. So we were lucky enough to be able to work with them and as they developed that vision uh, over many, many days. And they took this vision back to, to Yemen, and these leaders started meeting, re uh, reforming this vision, and then went and met with business leaders uh, through the, throughout Yemen in chambers in all the major cities. They were able to get opinion and input from these uh, people in the different uh, chambers in different regions of Yemen, uh, amend the vision, and then get buy-in and consensus about that vision that they were able to present to the government as one voice for the private sector in, in what is needed in the short term, medium term, and long term. Well, they get recognized. They get recognized by the media, they get recognized by the government. And right now we are seeing this, this leadership, the private sector leadership, be engaged in policies by the donor community in Yemen. Okay, lots of uh, 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 resources that are available for Yemen to move forward. Uh, lots of friends of Yemen and donor countries are willing to help, but now the private sector is engaged with the donor uh, community in how to spend this money, how to make the Yemen's absorptive capacity for these uh, resources uh, better. Uh, they were also engaged with the government in improving policy in, uh, on the security front, in the development front, in the infrastructure front. They're, they're part of the decision-making process. And finally, right now, these leaders represent the private sector inside the national dialogue. So they're, they're inside that uh, room as Yemen decides on its future, future through an inclusive national uh, dialogue. And we're trying to help them with resources, with policy papers, whatever they need as they themselves uh, uh, bring that important voice uh, into the democratic uh, process as an important constituency, one of the important constituencies in, uh, within Yemeni society to move forward with Yemen and on its democratic path. SEF is currently conducting a small and medium enterprise assessment in Aleppo, Idlib, and Hama. In addition to the assessment, what else can SEF do to be prepared for a post-conflict Syria? Well, there are Many, many things uh, uh, the Syrian Economic Forum can do. Uh, hopefully they will be able to develop a capacity to, uh, first of all, represent the voice of the private sector in the Syrian Forum. So it's important to organize the private sector, like we said, as a constituency that cares and that has um, a role to play in the future of Syria. So number one is organize the business community together into one voice. Second, as a think tank that represents the private sector, it's important that they offer policy solutions to uh, 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 Syria that has a bright future. So that they, they need to help. I mean, when uh, uh, policies, legislation, constitutions will be developed for Syria, where is the private sector's voice? They need to bring that, not just as a, an organized voice, but an organized voice that has uh, evidence-based uh, solutions. So they, they, that, they, they should play that role. Uh, finally, uh, maybe I said two, but there are three. The third one is to provide uh, immediate solutions to immediate needs right now. We have, for example, the Aleppo study that you said, it's extremely important. We have Aleppo is the industrial heartland of the country, Aleppo and the areas around it. There are small and medium manufacturers all over that now are unable to produce anything, to manufacture anything. And so can you imagine how many people are out of work uh, because of this shutdown? Can you imagine the economy, uh, that I did, how it is right now? What happens uh, 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 when, inshallah, the war will be over, over soon and we need all these people need to get, to get jobs? So the Syrian Economic Forum is providing a tremendous service uh, through partnership with other Syrian organizations to be able to identify 
the needs of these small and medium uh, manufacturing plants, producers, uh, so that as soon as an opening is there, uh, investments can pour in, equipment can come in, uh, people who are seeking jobs know where these jobs are available. So the young men and, uh, who are currently fighting the war have a, a, a hope that they can be employed and they can be productive and they can support their families instead of continuing the war. In my opinion, that's a tremendous service that they're providing, and it's one of the three pillars of what they are right now. Organizing the private sector through a, a, a voice, providing evidence-based solutions and policies for the future, and responding to immediate needs uh, for investment, for manufacturing, for providing jobs. We have seen the flight of human capital to other, to other countries in the Middle East, like Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. How do we encourage these people to return to Syria? by providing the proper environment in Syria. Uh, uh, Syrians care about Syria. They want to make Syria better. But when you have no hope and you have a family to support, you, you're going to, not just Syrians, anybody in the world would go out and try to find the best opportunity for them to be able to provide a good life for their families. So they're, and safe, you know, they're, they're, they're fleeing to Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey for opportunity, but more importantly, for safety. Uh, so if, you, if, if uh, Syrians provide a safe environment for them to come back, and then not just safe environment, but environment where they can have opportunity to succeed, they can have an opportunity to help provide for their families, Syrians love Syria, they will come back. <laughs> they will come back. It's just, again, providing the proper environment, political, security, and economic for them to come back. Syrians are very innovative people. Syrians are successful uh, business people. They're uh, some of the most uh, highly educated of the Arab world and the world. You know, people don't, don't know, uh, not many people understand what Syrians have been able to do in countries all over the world, including the United States, and making it successful uh, through innovation, through uh, uh, being good, productive uh, leaders. They will rebuild Syria if the environment is right for them. It is well known that the Middle East attracts a very low level of FDI. How can Syrian leaders design a new economic policies to encourage foreign investment? It's, I mean, Syria uh, has had a socialist economy for so long, socialist and, and uh, 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 status run from the top down. Uh, in, investment and financial resources go where it's welcome. Uh, unless you talk about, you know, people who want to benefit from a corrupt system, that money will come in, but it's not money that will help us, a, a country thrive economically. So if the opportunities are provided in Syria uh, through less corruption, actually, let's try to end corruption, uh, through making it easy for somebody to invest the money through registering, through getting access to capital, through uh, uh, proper supportive labor laws, through um, uh, ability to protect yourself if you lose, if you, so you don't you don't go to jail. So if these, if the environment is welcoming, money will flow. Uh, Syria is geographically situate, situated uh, in an area that uh, uh, is very welcoming to investment. Syria has the proper uh, labor force that's trained, that's hardworking, that can support investment. Syria has the proper sectors, whether uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, uh, tourism, it's some of the best tourism um, uh, areas or, or, uh, in, in the world, and uh, uh, also f with, with uh, re the resources to support that. And most importantly, the human capital. Syria has the human capital, skilled and unskilled, to support uh, investment. So if the environment improves, if the legal and regulatory environment improves, uh, and, and uh, let me add to that, there's also available capital to come into Syria from neighboring countries. There's a lot of investment capital that's available to come to Syria very quickly. So if the, if the uh, and, and goodwill towards the Syrian people for them to be, to come and invest. If the environment is welcoming, and by environment I mean legal and regulatory environment is welcoming, uh, FDI, uh, the foreign direct investment will increase uh, uh, in Syria. But I think there's a more important uh, source of investment that will come very, very quickly. Uh, estimates put uh, resources, financial resources of Syrians abroad at tremendous numbers. You know, we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars of Syrians that are outside. They will come back. Syrians want to invest in their own countries, like I said. The Syrians will come and rebuild the country, but they need the proper environment to be able to put that money into proper investments with the chance to succeed, but also 
enough uh, legal protection for them that this money will not be taken away from them, that corruption will not eat it uh, away, and that the security is there conducive for them to invest. So let's hope first that the CDM money will come in and FDI will come in also at the same time.